development of a new uh, array of products and services that are uh, many of which are very well known to you and, and many uh, are still to be revealed we are certain uh, in, in, in upcoming months and years. This success of the internet which we applaud at the IGF and chronicle and, uh, and give evidence to has been owed to the fact that the internet is an end-to-end -end network which has been successful precisely because of the seamless nature of traffic exchange and enabling new This means that many countries and companies across a broad spectrum of technological capability now have a stake in ensuring the trade route created by the internet is not unduly restricted. Fruits of internet enabled economic growth and prosperity are best realized in the markets for electronically delivered products and services, whether as a provider or user, remain open and access to the platform. Uh, is unimpeded by trade and regulatory barriers. Traditional models of trade rely on a vendor exporting or importing goods from a foreign supplier and selling them locally. Today, many online merchants uh, uh, offer a platform and services with direct sales to foreign customers for more than 20% of their turnover. Localization of internet infrastructure and services can act to facilitate or hinder the ability of such suppliers to sell to global markets. Localization of internet exchange points or hosting local content can, for example, make producers more competitive and facilitate trade. And this we understand to be a good development. On the other hand, some policies and practices can act as barriers to trade in the guise of globalization. In recent years, we have witnessed an increase globally in the number of governments requiring foreign companies that produce digital content and services to localize investments, production, services, procurements, or other activities as a condition for doing business in that country. We have seen the creation of artificial international gateways that extract rents based on regulated monopoly power. We have also seen the potentially adverse effects of internet traffic and charging arrangements based on the principle of sending party network pays that have been discussed in relation to the need to invest in upgrading local telecom networks. A key question, therefore, in respect to internet governance is the need to identify policies and practices that either open opportunities for economic and social development to trade or act as barriers to their realization. This panel of uh, distinguished uh, authorities on this subject will discuss these trends and their implications for internet governments, trade, and economic development. I would like to uh, introduce first uh, the panelists uh, and then, and in, in the order of their presentation, and then invite uh, the uh, panelists to begin in their presentations. First of all, we have uh, Jackie Ruff to my immediate right, uh, who is Vice President of International Public Policy and Regulatory Affairs for Verizon Communications. We have Rohan Sagarajave, uh, Chair of Learn in Asia. Uh, he will have uh, meetings to the right of uh, Jackie. Sam Paltridge of uh, the OECD, uh, who many of you know, and I've had the great pleasure of working with for many years. And to my immediate left is Joe Allardem, uh, who is Vice President for Global Public Policy and Chief Privacy Officer uh, at Oracle. With that as is is an introduction to the panelists, uh, and I would also indicate that uh, Alice Munya, who has uh, from Kenya, I wish to express my appreciation to her for the help this workshop together uh, because of her other commitments she will not be able to participate with us this morning. Let's begin. Jack, please. Thank you, Jeff, and thanks to everybody who's here to participate. Uh, we look forward to a good discussion. Let me just start off by uh, doing a little bit of a deeper dive on a couple of the themes that Dick put out there. 
on, you know, it, I, I think there is a fundamental question where the internet governance forum and what does international trade have to do with internet governance? And you refer to the end-to-end -end nature of the internet and the importance of seamless data flows, which is a good way of describing all of the, uh, the duplication in the nature of international trade and the internet. The trade is about enhancing the cross-border exchange of goods, services, etc. The internet and the network of networks is, in fact, the cross-border flow of data that is creating all of those uh, services and even, in some cases, uh, increasing the goods or at least enabling the exchange of those. And there's been a movement in recent years to uh, memorialize that close relationship in trade agreements to try to come up with some new concepts that really try to capture and advance that. And uh, it is particularly timely to be discussing these issues because of some kind of counter trends with the localization uh, that, uh, that uh, puts at risk the communication as well as the digital trade group. I always think it's useful to remind ourselves on some statistics, some numbers. We, we do tend to say many of them over and over again, but nonetheless in each context. And here, I think the context is, by the numbers that I'm going to throw out and the trends, that they really do describe what could be at risk if we don't get this right, if we don't use all the tools, whether it's multi-stakeholderism or international trade agreement, to preserve those seamless cross-border data flows. And, and what I'm talking about is, uh, uh, from the internet perspective, the fact that we do have uh, steady growth in internet users, that we have global IP traffic growing, and here I'll refer to some of my notes, that 20% a year we have um, 7 billion mobile subscriptions of the 2.7 billion internet subscribers said that 2.1, the very high percentage, are mobile internet subscribers. And uh, the mobile broadband subscribers are growing at an annual growth rate of 40%. If you look at you know, more, the newer trends, maybe things like machine to machine or what some would call Internet of the Things, it's projected that by 2017 there will be nearly three network devices for every person on Earth. Today, about half of the business data, the growing amount of consumer data, is being stored in the cloud. Global cloud traffic is projected to grow four and a half times during the five-year period of 2012 to 2017. And the highest rates of that type of growth are in emerging economies. I know in a workshop yesterday, Rohan was very good about pointing out the unevenness today of the ability for emerging economies to access cloud. That's definitely a trend. And if you look at a classic kind of international trade statistic, and this will be my last one, from 2000 to 2009, international trade in communications tripled, in computer and information services quadrupled, and by the way, uh, the recent statistics on export of uh, information and, and computer services, India is at the top of the list. Not surprising when we know the sophistication of the software uh, and other uh, internet related services in, in that economy. So, why am I putting this out there? Because this is a very important trend, it's very uh, very productive, very positive from the point of view of the global economy. What are the tools to accelerate that, to make sure that it's worldwide across all types of economies? And what are the tools to make sure we don't somehow have setbacks in that for various reasons that will be described later? So, um, I, I do want to underscore the point I'm making about uh, mobile broadband, high-speed internet access, 
the opportunities for that as we move to fourth generation technology and to then tie that to certain types of services, which I think particularly in a context like this where development is something we like to focus on. Think about um, uh, M banking, uh, financial services, many of those which are just inherently cross-border in nature. Now we always think of when you say Kenya, you think about Kenteza, which is the, uh, the pioneer in mobile banking, which we're starting to do more and more of in the US. But Kenya's been doing it for many, many years as a leader. But there are also all sorts of cross-border aspects of that, whether it's the big banks that are in many different countries and are just constantly exchanging data. Or it's something more like, uh, we were recently looking at something called Kiva, which is a micro-lending kind of thing, where uh, it's been around since 2005, over 600,000 people have loaned, this could be as much as $100 to people all around the world. In the education space, we're very common these days, of course, are the massive open online courses for the MOOC. And uh, one of the big providers in that space in the U.S. recently put out some of its statistics. 82% of the 3 million users, 3 million users today, uh, are outside the U.S. 82%, and more than half of the users are outside of the G7. So um, that is really something where all of course, the creation of them, the access of them, and just constantly kind of going across borders. I, another important area, of course, is healthcare, more and more telemedicine, more and more uh, connecting of cloud computing with, with frontline healthcare providers all around the world. A lot of that is, is cross border data. And then finally, uh, studies again and again show the particular importance for all this for small and medium enterprises, particularly cloud services where you don't have to have a, a, you know, obviate the need to have your computer, your hardware, your office, etc. You can access those, those services uh, through the cloud and that is a great enabler and a great uh, globalizer. These studies have been particularly good for a small FC, small medium enterprise to be able to access um, customers but also supply chains and so on. A lot of documentation on that. Now, what tools do we have right now in a little bit more detail? Very interesting period because in the area of international trade agreements, of the formal agreements, we've had a history in the last couple of years, beginning with the Korea-US agreement of, of actually having provisions in the trade agreements that deal squarely with these issues. They deal with users having open access to the internet, to deal with uh, there being commitments by governments to uphold the seamless flow of, of cross-border data and to refrain from requiring that servers uh, as well as data be located on their own borders. These principles were also expressed, and I don't know if Sam may elaborate on it, the OECD principles or uh, ICT principles. Subsequently, in some bilateral principle agreements between uh, Europe and the U.S. that later were adopted with some adaptations by Japan, Taiwan, um, and another one was Mauritius, and so on. And then we've got three major agreements that are under negotiation. So one that's in the final stages is the Trans-Pacific Partnership. So that would be nations on, on both sides of the, of the Pacific. There have been two that have just started in the last couple months. The Trade and Services Agreement, which uh, includes, you get my numbers right, 48 participants. So Europe comprises many of those, but it's also nations like uh, Chile, Colombia, Pakistan, that are a real range in kind of economic development. And these issues are teed up in that agreement, just at the beginning of stages. The other one is the Transatlantic Partnership which of course is Europe and the U.S. And I think the interesting thing there is that that agreement won't need to do uh, some of the kind of fundamental issues that many of the international trade agreements do that are very important, but it can start off from a different point because those, those markets are highly competitive. Some of the other agreements would deal with things that are important, uh, like competition and backhaul, competition under some cables and those sorts of things. But 
this one might be able to take this issue of cross-border data flow uh, to a new level. And then my final point will be, and this is one of the themes of the workshop, what's the connection to domestic and local law? And obviously there are many things that can be done within local law to facilitate the expansion of the positive trend that I was describing at the beginning. And I'm sure that we'll cover that in some of the presentations as well. So that's just my kind of theme setting of new directions in the economy, the internet economy, and the new opportunities in the trade setting to try to use that as one of our channels for kind of positive internet growth, which I think is very much part of the internet governance forum. Oh, well, wow. so thanks. Thank you very much, Jackie. Uh, thank you. Uh, I think there's a very topical issue that uh, one that uh, should be addressed in some detail at this point. Uh, I'll be using a few slides. Uh, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> I'd like to begin with a story. Uh, we are a regional research organization and uh, we conduct uh, a series of studies called uh, Tell You Set Bottom of the Pyramid. Uh, we have been doing this since 2006. And one of the countries that we did this work, we use about 10,000 uh, samples. So this is a quantitative uh, sample, a representative sample uh, surveys. But in addition, we do uh, uh, qualitative. Uh, studies. We go sit in people's homes, uh, two hours, we talk to them about how they are using the internet. And uh, our focus is of course uh, on the bottom of the pyramid, so the people that we are reaching out to are people who are living on approximately uh, $2 US a day or less. So we were intrigued in, uh, in Indonesia actually, in this country, to find that in the early part of the conversation, uh, our respondents were telling us that they are not familiar with the internet, they don't use the internet. And a little later, they started talking about Facebook. So we were, what is that? Yeah. Uh, you ask the straight question about the internet, you get an answer, yeah, we don't know. We don't use that. But Facebook, oh, of course we use Facebook. So what this illustrates, and I think just to sort of add to that, is that we have a partner organization in, uh, in Africa, called Research ICT Africa, which does similar uh, studies in a large number of 12 or 19 countries, depending on, on the year, uh, among uh, uh, the, sort of, among the uh, uh, tele-users, people who have some familiarity, who may not own the equipment, but are using uh, the technology. And they actually found that in the questionnaire that they had used, they had the same problem, they had to go back and clean it up. In the sense that there were errors because people were answering no to the internet question and yes to either Facebook or Vixit or some kind of social media. So what this illustrates is the importance of attractive uh, content uh, which is, you know, ostensibly free uh, in terms of getting people onto the internet. Uh, because it's an ecosystem, you can't just talk about coverage, you can't just talk about handsets, you can't just talk about uh, price, but those things are important. But in addition, you need attractive content. That is what's bringing people onto the net. So I had this other conversation with some Indonesian policymakers. And they were saying, what is going on? Why is Facebook giving us so much of free services? Uh, because, you know, at different points of time, Indonesia is in some position the top five of Facebook using countries, right? Sometimes it's two, sometimes it's four, etc. And I said, no, that's a different business model. It's a, it's a different business model. So they said, okay, so if it is a different business model, and if it's advertising based, um, are they making a lot of money if they're advertising to us? Uh, because most of our people who are using Facebook are poor people who don't have a lot of political power. I said, well, the idea is that, you know, they'll get rich one day. 
and then they will be, be, be a very even more attractive audience. And I'm a person who actually advertises on Facebook uh, to reach certain kinds of specialized segment and uh, groups in this region. So I'm somewhat familiar with this business model of giving away or apparently giving away content and gaining attention in return. Now this business model is fundamentally different from the one that the old style telcos, uh, I suppose with some exceptions, are familiar with. Their problem <coughs> is this. This is the first uh, two years after smartphones hit Hong Kong. And you can see that the usage generated only from the wireless or mobile networks has gone up by about 20 times over that period, not 20%, 20 times. Right? So we are talking about a veritable data tsunami. And if you don't keep throwing more capacity at this problem, you are going to have very congested, uh, locked up uh, uh, networks. So you do get some unimaginative responses. Uh, any other business, if you get a lot of business, a lot of new customers coming in, new customers consuming a lot of, lot of your product, you will generally be happy. Instead, I was at some of the widget uh, prep, uh, preparatory meetings uh, last year in Ghana, and I actually heard people saying, this is a burden for our network. This is harming our network. Right? How do we stop people from using our services? Now I found this sort of mind-boggling because all my life in government as well as outside government I've been trying to get people to use data, to use internet, to use all these wondrous capabilities that it affords. And here I have telco people or government people saying this is a burden, how do we prevent this from happening? Right? So these people unfortunately have certain unimaginative solutions to this problem. And one of their solutions was, okay, um, two-sided markets, how do we extract some money from somewhere? And they looked around and they saw, okay, Google's got money, Facebook has got money, how can we take some money from that? A uh, little difficult to negotiate with these big players when you are, you know, a telco in Senegal or Togo or something. So why don't we go to the government, the usual tactic of monopolies, why don't we go to the government and get the privileged arms and mandate that in the same way that we used to be given international voice monopolies, etc., why don't we tell them to help us? And maybe, you know, it's not our government, why don't we go to the ITU and get them to help us? So, uh, in the middle of 2012, there was a very high probability that this story would play out. And there would be an international treaty, a talking about international law, that would have mandated something called sending party network pays. That is, when I'm sitting in uh, Indonesia and I send out a request to Facebook, it's a small, uh, let us take another database, uh, and a lot of information, pictures, etc., come back, the network in that other country would have to pay my network for something that I do, which sounds completely counterintuitive and wrong, but yeah, that is what sending money network pays means. Now, our argument was, uh, I mean, my organization is basically living on the cloud, and if this happens, I have to shut down my organization, so I have some personal interest in this matter. But also, I think it will break the particular business model that is driving poor people in our parts of the world onto the internet and use its potential, right? What would happen is that in certain countries that are asking for these payments, certain content providers would say, sorry, you don't deal with it, we don't give you this. I occasionally get that even today when I go to certain uh, US sites, not from your country, right? That is organization. The other thing, of course, would be as go back to my argument that even though we are poor in large numbers, we are still an attractive market, would be that quite a lot of this information would go behind paywalls. Because the network who has to pay will say, hey, content provider, you pay us because we got paid these other people who are extracting money from us. 
Now, we can go beyond pay. Well, I'm saying I'm not 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 saying I'm not
and uh, difficulties that we are experiencing now. Uh, because Asia is now the sort of the center of gravity for ICT development, and it is time that we have commensurate uh, leadership in international whole uh, enterprises that we currently have with green enterprises. Thank you. Uh, I think we're going to try and may not work to let you know. Uh, it's <laughs> Basically, hosted 
quite sure. Uh, now, this, this is another list, and Rowan loves to point out this one, which is Yemen, which may not be best practice uh, with its infrastructure, so it's very uh, blue color there. Um, Rowan, I think there's a civil war going on there, so well, there's obviously obstacles there. But, you know, what this is, is, is taking the top million sites in the lake server. Now, if a country only has one site, in the top million sites, and that one site happens to be located in your country, there can be anomalies. But basically, you know, looking at the OECD countries, it's about what we expect. And what we found was that there was three countries uh, in the OECD where more than 50% of their species content is posted offshore. Um, I'll tell you what they are. You can see probably uh, in the map, this one is a bit hard to see, but you know, you've got Mexico, you've got Canada, and you've got Greece. So let's go through some of the reasons that might be applied here in terms of uh, where there's local content. Because I look at it as a potential local content. It's hosted. Um, Mexico. Mexico, in fact, is potentially a reason for the country not to have an internet exchange. Today I just find that extraordinary, but it's still the case. Um, the good news is the Mexican government is taking uh, action. You know, the president is aware of this, and uh, in the reforms that have been introduced, it's one of their priorities to establish an internet exchange point. But essentially, what not having an internet exchange point has meant is that that content is hosted across the border in the United States, and Mexico creates a lot of local content. Um, but of course, the costs associated with that are greater because that content is posted in the United States to where it could be. Now, if it was hosted locally, um, you would have to take the traffic to the United States, bring it back, etc., etc., et cetera, and it was You know, I said that in my mind. If it was hosted locally, you would not have to take it to the United States. But essentially, people are hosting the content in the United States. So there's a trade-off here. You don't want to stop people hosting that content before because it creates a competitive dynamic there. But at the same time, you want to encourage local content hosting because that's going to benefit everyone. Benefit, uh, you say, users and benefit, uh, business providers and so forth. The other countries I'll just mention quickly, Canada is only near the typical in Mexico and the deep in California. Basically, I think it's the proximity to the US. But even there, the government's recognised that it can be better, and it's a packet very good to do a review of their internet exchange points to get other updated. And the government's done this for to encourage people to host the content uh, in Canada. Greece, I'm actually not sure what Greece has done. Uh, and Greece is quite interesting because it's the only country where two of the countries host more uh, local content than Greece does. One is the United States, the other one is Germany. Now, why is Germany host a lot of Greek content? Well, it could be that Irish Telecom owns the, the largest provider in, in Greece. Uh, it could be that there's a major internet exchange point which is very efficient and inexpensive to host the content uh, in Germany. We're not sure. But essentially, the message I'd like to take, you know, take away is that localization can be a fantastic area of economy and the internet. If it is, it is uh, market driven, if it's providers doing it, what's up to do? Fish will do so. If you come in and say you must do it, then what the internet they are doing is speak to the almost uh, see that as a whole somewhere in the network and it will not bypass from that area. That's the reality of this. I'll just finish with one final slide, one final example, go back to one more. Well, there's a glitch there. What it would have shown <laughs> is uh, what, what has happened is, um, and I wanted, wanted to show you was an example from India compared to, compared to what's happening in Africa. So, roughly the same number of people in terms of the generation. One country, and what the data shows is the traffic coming from the United States, 
Cuma tuh kan nyoba-nyoba rekat aja. <laughs> Kalau di sini mah banyak, dokunya yang nggak banyak, dokunya yang nggak banyak. Iya, di kota Ramadia. Microfinance, including capital markets, what have you. 
information flow, information that the currency or the oil of the economy, how is that economy set for the concept of information flows and how they may be used? Innovation, how does that economy support innovation? Intellectual capital, what is the role and the preparation of the population in terms of ICT literacy, in terms of linguistics, in terms of entrepreneurship? Infrastructure, what's the technical, logistical, regulatory infrastructure for the company of the country? And then the last one was actually pure cheating. So it's called integration, but it actually means trade. And uh, it could come with a better eye, so it's called integration. And that's the concept of trade behind the border, at the border, across the border. And those elements together create kind of an ecosystem of policy frameworks for government. And the issue is you can't take anyone from out of context without affecting all of the others. They are all overlapping and tied to each other, much like the internet ecosystem of those data flows is all overlapping and tied to each other. So you have to start thinking about when you take an action in one place, you create a reaction and a limitation somewhere else. So the concept Sam was pointing out is localization might be good if it's a market dynamic that's raised to the top for giving consumers better, more efficient service, more tailored to them in terms of the locality of the content and maybe the nature of the content, drafted in local language responsive to local need. But when that's a forced reaction, you end up getting the concept of it's going to be seen as a network, as an apparent context to the network, and the network's going to start to avoid it. And one of the reasons that happens is because apart from information flows, we actually have supply chains being global also, and they have to be optimized across the country. And there are, there are plenty of legitimate reasons why countries move towards localization strategies that are more mandated than they are market driven. And sometimes they are the hope of building infrastructure and capacity in the country. Sometimes they are security driven. Sometimes they are driven by the concept of wanting to protect citizens from potential harms or establishing their rights. All of which are completely legitimate and understandable goals. But goals which you could actually better further through things that are less burdensome on trade and less burdensome on innovation. It's not that the objective or the desire is incorrect, it's perfectly correct. It's the mechanism of achieving it that is counterproductive. Because by creating that level of insulation, by taking away the elements of competition, you are actually likely to increase the cost of the service to your customer. You are likely to actually decrease the innovative potential of your own market. And you are also going to be in a position where you may well limit the access to some of these services in your market altogether. Uh, that was one of the examples uh, that was given earlier when we were talking about the pricing models. So these are very damaging consequences to very well-intentioned items that people are trying to solve. It's not the problem of what you're trying to solve, it's how you're solving it. And this is one of the concepts where a multi-stakeholder dialogue can be a very good thing to talk about it because you don't want to focus the conversation on the solution. You want to focus the conversation on the problem and talk about different ways to get to that problem. Because too often when we only talk about the solution, it's, it's, a, it's a conversation of conflict that doesn't yield resolute results. But when you're able to talk about the problem and the different ways of solving those problems, that's a much more constructive path forward. The other thing I think which is sometimes underlying some of these regulations is the concept of an attempt to drive and develop infrastructure at local level. Oh, we must have data centers in our country. Oh, the cloud must be served in our country. And it's useful to have infrastructure in your country. But it is a total, it is totally missing the potential benefit of the leverage of the technology. Because while there is a benefit to having the technology served or originating in your country, the ability of your people to use the technology to create innovative business models and services is where the leverage or financial benefit really comes into the equation of the economy. And that leverage is tremendously important. With that leverage will also come better understanding of how to use these technologies. And over time, that race to the top will yield the benefits of creating the infrastructure because you will create the environment using the correct balance of the six I's 
by which you will have people want to invest in the country, or you will have local folks in the country develop skill sets. The, the, the BPO industry, sorry, the business process outsourcing industry in India was given as an example. That was an industry which was kind of one of these virtuous circles, or a race to the top, as I call it. It started out with an industry that provided fairly minimal service that didn't have a lot of skills. It morphed and emerged and continued and became an industry that moved into a higher set of skills, a higher set of services. Now it's not just an industry that delivers higher services, it's an export industry that has actually competitive advantages across many other industries in many developed countries. And it was a prophecy where the lack of the constraint related to regulation and the right conditions for a regulatory context allow that industry to flourish and develop. It's one of the best examples of the race to the top and the conditions which made it happen. So as we look at the localization issues, and we, we don't detract from the benefits of when you make some things local in a market-based, voluntary fashion that serves the benefits of the citizens and others. We don't detract from the fact that you need to consider privacy, security, and a number of the other related issues. But the more you end up having paradigms of forced localization, even if for well-intentioned purposes, the more likely you are to artificially constrain the market dampen the innovation of your country and actually limit yourself to the lowest common denominator that was the race at the time. Thank you very much, Joe. Uh, much here for us to draw upon and to ask questions about and make comments uh, following these uh, excellent presentations. Uh, let me first have invite uh, you all uh, to offer any kind of comment or question that you may have based on the presentations or from any thoughts that you have related to the, the subjects of trade and globalization uh, and internet governance. I would also at this point like to introduce my colleague uh, Barbara Warner, uh, who is the remote moderator, and she's very much with us, uh, but she will be also monitoring see if we have any uh, questions coming in uh, remotely. The first to you all, do you have any questions or comments that you wish to make? Yes, please. Uh, hi, my name is Corny. I'm with the World Wide Web Consortium. I'm the chair of the Web Payments Group there. Uh, one of the things that we're focusing on uh, right now is building payments into the core architecture of the web. Uh, and that's one of the things that I haven't really heard uh, discussed um, in, in a number of the in, in a number of workshops here is, is this idea that the internet could become um, the framework that we build the next generation um, uh, trade mechanism on top of. So this is, this is not just information flows; it's actual financial transactions, financial flows. Why are we building that on top of the, on top of the internet? And that's exactly what we're doing in this group. So, so my, my question is, why is the um, discussion uh, not being framed in those terms? We have this gigantic, uh, the largest network that has ever existed in humankind. Uh, we move all sorts of information over it. Uh, but when it comes to payment and trade, uh, we treat that function of the network as kind of this um, second class citizen. Right? The idea that, that you can send a message to somebody on the other end of the other side of the world by just having an email address, we built protocols to achieve that um, many years ago. But to this day, well, until the web games group started up, we, we weren't thinking about sending money in the same way uh, around the world. So, so the question is, is fairly general. How, how do we shift uh, the discussion to talking about um, building trade into the core of, of the internet and the web. Um, and, and specifically, how do we get policy people involved in, in, in that discussion? Is there a response? Uh, it may appear to be a simple technical problem, but it's a horrendous uh, policy problem. Uh, we have a situation, I actually have prohibited my team from using the word uh, mobile banking. Uh, just, you know, 
just don't ever mention that again. Kind of cringe. Uh, because what a lot of our countries, we're trying to get people, give people the ability to move money, as you said, within the country using the ubiquitous mobile telephones that they have, which are not even smartphones, which are feature phones, right? And that has been demonstrated in Kenya. But in a lot of other countries, it has been very difficult because the banking industry has been blocking it and the governments have not been putting a standard. Now, in a few places, we do have uh, people moving money across borders, uh, Philippines, etc. Right? Using these mechanisms, using the mobile. Uh, again, the governments are very wary. There is a simple rule called Know Your Customer, which has been actually imposed on our countries, governments by the United States, in fact, uh, and uh, which then causes all sorts of difficulties with the cash in, cash out. Uh, steps that are needed at the end of the, the two ends of the relationship. So uh, I know this is not web, uh, web payments, this is mobile payments, but this is what people got. This is what where most of the, the electronic technology is with poor people, right? So we are having difficulty here at getting there. I would say we are making incremental progress, right? I think if once we crack these problems, uh, when the web payments sort of easy web payments model comes in, I think the, the situation will be a lot more receptive. Of course, the interesting question that I find intellectually interesting is that the advertising models that are quite predominant, uh, not only sort of with the over the top players, but you know, every time I go to judge a more uh, ICT innovations competition, most of these kids are looking for advertising supported models because of the difficulty of getting people to pay. Uh, so it's very interesting that it's the very difficulty of payments that is pushing this model. Now if payments becomes easy, will this model fall? Interesting question. I don't have an answer. Thank you very much for our objective. If I just speak to this uh, in the context of the trade agreements that are actually being negotiated and I think that you, you raised a very important uh, opportunity really and task to be done. Um, we've been working a lot with the negotiators in the US and other countries to try to uh, explain to them how things actually work and in a way that's why it's a very basic statistics on the internet and its growth and what's happening and so on. Because you often have as oh, the negotiators experts in trade negotiations, not in the digital economy. And they may have been doing this mechanism for 20 years. This is their expertise and their frame of reference dates back to the other side. You know, an economy and ways of doing things sometimes. So I would commend uh, any way that the uh, here and others that you know just get out there, explain things, etc. And I think that, that there would be a welcoming of that. Even the sort of things that we do today about how the service and how they work and so on. Uh, it's eagerness to learn, but it won't happen when we can push it out.
Aku tahu Kayaknya yang terus minta sama si Miss Buddy itu Gue bikin additional session Ternyata Apa aja sih? Bentar aja kayak kesannya gue maksud banget
geographical maps, for example, and potentially some of the time expressions that are on the WTO the geographical maps. And one of the most controversial ones is dot Y and dot Min, where different governments around the world have different perspectives on what sort of arrangement should be around those domains. And this is a very controversial area, and in many ways, I think I'm better settled at the WTO rather than uh, I can. But essentially, that becomes more and more important to publish those sorts of train issues that are going to war, which perhaps are best suited to do. Um, on, I can address the doctor, I can certainly not have to do with what's happening there at the moment. I know the RIRs have established various transfer mechanisms. It's very important that they do that because as technologies develop, they have to develop for a variety of reasons. It's good to know that you have to be able to track those transfers for responsible medical workers for the purposes of the business. I think we'll do yeah, I think when we think about having the initial issuance of the domain name, there is a dispute resolution process that you're using for every time. And that's usually a dispute resolution process where there's a different process of the name. The question is whether the name is not using all the other issues related to the tab. As you get into the secondary market, it's more likely to be a contractual dispute related to the arrangement of transferring. And there are already plenty of existing dispute resolution systems for those contractual disputes to be settled. If not specific to that, then the question is whether it's cost effective for those dispute resolution systems to be used because the value of the contract may not be substantial and the other type of thing is being exchanged in the secondary market. So, you know, one of the questions might be this might be an issue where some of the online dispute resolution systems may be used for that purpose. But I, I, I think. It's a different nature of the dispute resolution that you have in the first place, perhaps. Uh, and, and therefore, the question is whether there are out of the contractual dispute resolution systems that can be used. Thank you very much. I think there was a question in the back. Uh, yes, please. Hand up. Hand up. Okay. Michael, I have a good question to talk about this question. You mentioned that the motion that is in the United States has been enforced that there is a provision of the legal information in the e-commerce chapter, but it has also been reported that some of the substantial pushback from some of the countries I just want to talk about the you were doing very nowadays because prior to what is supposed to be an intersectional of crystal information, a couple of months ago, we have not seen anything in feedback about that for you. There are just one to review where you did update. Um, I'm not sure if I understand. I can't. Um, I think the dynamic that you described <coughs> is one that I have also heard, <coughs> namely, and, and it's understandable, I think, on, the, on these issues, what one wants to do is to have promotion as much as possible and see much cross-border data flow, while also having protection of privacy, security, etc. So whether we're looking at trade agreements, domestic policy, norms, et cetera, we realize that there are a number of different public policy goals. And so I, I don't have an update on particular detail, but uh, I, I do agree that uh, it's important that sorting those things out in this particular agreement has been complex. But I've also heard a lot of willingness to ultimately having something to set up that bans uh, in the cross border data flow area. Thank you very much. Are there other uh, comments or questions? Barbara, do you need anything to say? While we're thinking perhaps of some other comments or questions, uh, let me uh, pose a couple of questions or at least uh, 
agreed to comment that they can be uh, responded to by the panelists or by those in the audience. Uh, we had a discussion that focused on a number of business models that are arising. Uh, that uh, speak to this relationship between trade uh, and uh, the internet. And we've also spoken about uh, best practices uh, in this area. The panelists have all given us an excellent example that we need to focus on. Uh, the question I wish to pose is to the panelists and to the audience who may be here, and this perhaps relates to a number of points that you made already by the, by the uh, audience. Are we doing enough in our various organizations to focus on uh, these issues? How to develop uh, better relationships between trade discipline and this digital economy that we are all a part of? And that uh, Without a greater focus upon that relationship, perhaps it is uh, we are not seeing the kind of results in the actual trade negotiations that are undertaken uh, that we would hope for. To put it another way, uh, is there more that, for example, Sam, the OECD can do in this area in kind of preparing the environment uh, for trade negotiations to bring uh, to a uh, perspective on these? relationship between trade and the internet? Is there more of that that can be done between international organizations, APEC, uh, uh, OECD, WTO, APEC, OECD, and other regional organizations to foster this kind of discussion that, is, that would prepare the environment, so to speak, uh, for the trade negotiators once they actually undertake uh, the the Complicated process of the negotiations. Sam, could you offer something to my help? Yeah. 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 Yeah.
telecommunications. It has been interesting to me almost to see the architecture, the, the internal architecture of the WTO, uh, uh, the, particularly the, the gap survey, where you have telecommunications mentioned as an annex in one part, where you're conceptualizing it as a support mechanism, a necessary precondition for the other trade to work. And then you have the agreement of basic telecommunication services, where you're looking at it as the object of trade, as something that is traded. And a lot of people don't sort of quite appreciate the way you have leveraged these two things of each other. I was actually quite surprised in last year's debates uh, around this trying to bring a broken uh, sender teams or sending party team, uh, sending party network phase model that doesn't even work for voice and trying to impose it on, on data. And people didn't really explore what kind of possible interactions there were with trade the kind of commitments that different countries had made. Because very clearly in the original negotiation there were exceptions made to uh, some of these termination rate regimes as being implicitly inconsistent with the basic principle. Now if that was inconsistent, why is it that it is not inconsistent to impose that model on data? And you know, it was a pretty rushed uh, effort, sadly, as in most public policy uh, debates. Uh, we don't think of these things in the long term. So when the threat is upon us and the IP is going to meet and try to impose this ill thought out rules, we all get here and then start running around trying to try to push it back. And in that situation we really didn't have the time to, to understand these interfaces, the interactions. And what I would like is uh, an ideal world, I would do it, but I don't live in an ideal world, I don't have the time to look at the interactions and, and get people to understand uh, the interactions between the two, even now, uh, as we move in to try to impose various kinds of rules on, uh, on international data traffic for the internet. Thank you very much, Roman. Thank you. That's what I use. And so, let's say you're a little old fashioned and you go to the store and you buy the program and you come down and you put the disk in your hard drive and you load it onto your computer and you're using the program. Or you're perhaps a little more online and you download the program online and have to be caught up Or now you have the opportunity that you can actually have the program served to you that you can access it on your own server and you still only pay by the time you need to use the program. All of them have the same impact. The person who uses the program, they are treated completely differently in the trade goods, services, etc. And so, if we attempt to re-architect the entire trade discussions that have happened until now in order to fix this problem of the same, same habit having different effects, we would wreak havoc in the trade world because we would create massive unintended consequences due to other products that we so businesses have very practical solutions. If you make your commitments at a slightly higher level, then you avoid the differentiation. This would be the concept of that. The discussions that have been around the trade program the concept of the digital dropping. And there are practical solutions that can be had, but we just have to get beyond our doctrine and our basis. Because rather than try to recreate the entire system, which has tremendous unintended consequences, there are actually practical workarounds help you to get agreements that are beneficial and useful without having to rework the entire system. So, you know, part of this is understanding, trade understanding technology, and then understanding where the potential of trade, but also understanding the value, the value of the list point is inherent. And you can't just go ahead and say, well, some technologists come from the trade world and say, people don't know what you're talking about, I'm just going to go and compare it. Start from scratch and rebuild it. And that's not a useful method to be there, but there are practical solutions to the problems. 
we just have to stop talking past each other and figure out the best way to talk to each other. Thank you very much. Uh, are there any comments anyone wishes to make? Yes, please. Um, on this morning, World Wide Web Consortium. So uh, I've been working with the World Wide Web Consortium for around uh, seven years now, and not once. And I remember um, somebody from the policy world being involved in any of the technical standards that they got off the ground, even when we sent out a request for someone from policy to be involved. Um, that's changing a bit today. Uh, but talking a bit to just point made earlier, you know, it's the, the question is, you know, maybe it's not to get policy people into the technical world, maybe it's you can to get technical people into the policy world. Um, I, I, I spent the last uh, three weeks at the World Banking Conference. We have uh, you know, 6,000 some odd international banks talking about their payments. Um, I also spent at Google and Facebook and um, the Solis headquarters in Silicon Valley. Week before that, down at the IGF, and in every single one of those situations, the general um, the general thought is we're not going to go to the other people; they should come to us. Right? And because of that, because of that line of thinking, and it's pretty universal. And I understand why there's that, that line of thinking exists, but we have very little cross pollination on these groups. So. You know, doing doing payments correctly on the internet or on the web is a multi-stakeholder thing. You need to have a multi-stakeholder dialogue to do that. The problem is that te the technologists, the policy folks, uh, the large companies, the banks uh, believe that it's somebody else's job to come in and engage on them. They don't believe that we need to go out and do it. So that that that's a problem, right? So so how do we how do we solve that? I, I absolutely don't have the answer. We are going out and meeting with all these people, but it's very difficult to pull these different organizations together. Um, even, even, even when you say that we believe in the same old dialogue, all these reasons believe in that. Uh, I know IGF believes in that, but in practice, we are not really seeing that happen. Thank you very much. Are there any questions that you wish to be on? I think it's a very important statement, and uh, we're approaching the conclusion. I will offer you a chance to comment. Uh, Britain from Rabbit, New Zealand. So, one of the things that I think has become very relevant with payments in recent years is the fat uh, uh, from the US. Uh, I know that the uh, web company is doing payments all over the side of trying to hold balances um, of cash rather than doing payments.
uh, and that needs to be overcome in order for us to have the kind of discussion and understanding that's going to help an environment be created to get the kind of agreements in the trade world that are going to facilitate digital products. So thank you for your intervention. I'm going to conclude on that because I think it's an excellent point which perhaps brings together a lot of other points that we've had here in the workshop. Uh, on that note, uh, Barbara, I'd like to express my appreciation to you, Barbara, who was instrumental in organizing this workshop and to all the panels. Thank you very much and thank you to the audience.